Trevor Baker, 1-8-22. The two case studies I researched were case study two and case study three. For case study two, the first question was, I'm not sure I understand the issue. Can you explain how muscle glycogen is used normally during exercise? Glycogen is a very important substance that is stored in muscles and allows your body to be able to exercise. The overall function of glycogen in the muscle is to produce a molecule of glucose called glucose 1-phosphate that is used to make energy for the body through glycolysis in the muscle and then gluconeogenesis in the liver. This can be very confusing to follow for anyone of any education, so I will explain in a way that makes more sense to you as well as myself. If one building block is a molecule of glucose, then many of them connected together is called glycogen. These connected building blocks are stored in the muscle for when energy is needed. When you exercise, energy is needed. Therefore, the muscle breaks down these building blocks into individual glucose molecules called glucose 1-phosphate, which can be used in different processes from muscle to liver to create the energy needed for muscle to contract during your exercise. Without muscle glycogen, your muscle does not have the energy needed for contraction. The second question, I really like to take long walks. Will I still be able to do this with my friends? As I stated before, muscle glycogen is essential for muscle contraction during exercise. It gives the muscles energy to keep working. For someone who has the correct amount of muscle glycogen phosphorylase, the enzyme needed to cleave glycogen to form glucose 1-phosphate, the immediate energy needed for muscle contraction is released without issue. However, when there's a defic defi deficiency in this enzyme, muscle glycogen phosphorylase, like you have, this energy that is needed for contraction can be stopped because glucose 1-phosphate cannot be formed properly. This type of deficiency leads to the body experience muscle cramping or exercise intolerance when immediate energy is needed due to the muscles not contracting properly. To add, rhabdomyolysis can occur, which is a breakdown of muscle and can release a damaging protein into the bloodstream that can damage your kidneys. However, because you are doing very long walks with your friends, you are engaging in aerobic exercise. These side effects of your deficiency are from an anaerobic exercise or intense exercise like lifting weights. Therefore, you can still go on long walks with your friends, but avoid any fast exercise or stop if you start to feel cramping. The third question, as a, role, as, as a result of this defi deficiency, will I need to get up at night to eat to maintain my blood glucose levels? You will not need to get up in the middle of the night to eat with your deficiency to maintain blood glucose levels. With your deficiency, the muscle is lacking glycogen phosphorylase, not your liver. Therefore, throughout the day, the body is still working to maintain blood glucose levels through glycogenolysis and glycolysis. At night, the liver is still working to produce enough glucose for the bloodstream when you are in that state of fasting. This process is called gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis occurs in your liver and works with non-carb substrates to produce this glucose for your body when you are fasting. Although there is no cure for this disorder that you have, it is suggested that you have a high-carb diet before engaging in any type of exercise. Studies have shown that patients with the same deficiency as you have yielded better results when you exercising on a high carb diet. Question number four, do I need to worry about producing ex excessive lactate during intense anaerobic exercise? There is no need to worry about producing excess lactate during intense anaerobic exercise. Due to the deficiency of muscle phosphorylase, glucose 1-phosphate cannot be formed, which cannot enter glycolysis to form lactate that is produced during anaerobic exercise. In other words, under normal conditions, the body pro produces lactate as a side effect of intense exercise when oxygen is limited in the process glycolysis. This lactate can then be used to produce the energy needed during this intense exercise. However, your body is not able to do so. When the metabolism of glycogen is disrupted from your deficiency, excess levels of lactate cannot be produced. So you actually have a lower amount of lactate production than someone who does not have your deficiency. But as said before, an intense level exercise should be avoided due to the damages that can occur. For case study three, the first question is, what is this information likely to suggest about the underlying biochemical basis for the patient's symptoms? So this patient is experiencing low levels of insulin both in baseline blood samples and after a glucose load. In a normal patient, the insulin levels increase after a glucose load due to the increase of glucose in the bloodstream. 
The insulin is secreted from the pancreas, which allows glucose to enter the cells in the body to produce energy. In this patient, they are experiencing some type of defect that is keeping insulin from being formed and secreted. Therefore, the glucose will continue to build up in the bloodstream, resulting in hyperglycemia, or high blood sugar. This condition results in the symptoms of excessive urination and frequent thirst like the patient is experiencing. When the bloodstream contains too much glucose, the kidneys cannot keep up with filtering and absorbing, absorbing the glucose. The glucose that is not filtered is then transported out of the body through urine, which brings along other liquids from the body's tissues. As the body continues to urinate and lose fluid, it will become thirsty so the patient can replace the lost fluids. These high blood glucose levels can also have a significant effect on a patient's overall energy. This patient lacks insulin secretion, which is responsible for bringing glucose molecules into cells for energy. When this does not occur, fat then becomes the main source of energy, ultimately leading to a fall in ADP phosphorylation and lower ATP resynthesis. If I had to make an educated guess based on the glucose load results and the patient's symptoms, I would guess that the patient will be diagnosed with either type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, or hyperinsulinemia. Hyper the second question, what would you predict the patient's fasted blood glucose levels to be given his current condition? I would predict, predict that this patient's fasted blood glucose levels would be higher than the control value for fasting glucose levels. I predict this is because insulin is used to move glucose molecules into cells when there is a significant amount of glucose in the body. When insulin production is limited, the glucose will stay in the bloodstream and not be lowered over a period of time. Therefore, even after a period of fasting, glucose levels may still be higher than normal because they did not interact with the insulin. This is true for patients who suffer from diabetes. Normal uh, fasting blood glucose levels are less than 100 mg per dl. Pre-diabetes fasting glu glu glucose levels are 100 to 125, and diabetes fasting glucose levels are 125 or greater. The patient above was not able to produce sufficient insulin after a glucose load, so they will have higher levels of glucose in the bloodstream even, after, even during a fast. The final question, uh, based on this diagnosis, what two regulatory enzymes are likely to be active in this individual's current condition? So the two regulatory enzymes that will be active in this patient due to their diagnosis would be glucose 6-phosphatase and fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. When insulin production is not decreased, it works to inhibit these two enzymes that work in gluconeogenesis. Glucose 6-phosphatase is increased because its main role is to produce glucose that is released into the blood. When a high amount of glucose is released into the blood, insulin is then secreted to inhibit this enzyme, ultimately leading to a stop in the production of glucose. When no insulin is released, glucose 6-phosphatase can continue to help form glucose that can run freely in the bloodstream. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase is also active in the formation of glucose. This enzyme helps create fructose 6-phosphate, which gets converted to glucose 6-phosphate and then glucose. Therefore, we can think of insulin as a key to the, door, to the two doors which hold these enzymes. When the main room, the bloodstream, becomes filled with people, glucose, the key, which is insulin, locks the door to not allow any more people to come in. When the key is lost, resulting in insulin deficiency, people can continue to come in and crowd the room, resulting in an excessive amount of people. That is the end of my two case studies video. My resources for both uh, case studies are shown below. Thank you.